Welcome back everybody, or if this is your first time joining the uh, HP Tech Series video, welcome. So I'm Rob from Boosted Cycle Performance, and this is the HP Tech Series that uh, I've started for the shop YouTube. Uh, the focus of HP Tech is to show you guys uh, all the little tricks to what it takes to, to build these bikes and to show that it's not really as difficult. And uh, I mean, if you can turn, if you can turn a wrench on a car, basically, and you can do, you know, build an engine for a car, you can do this stuff too. It's just things are a bit more compact and uh, they're just set up a little bit differently. So getting right into it, this is the uh, thousand horsepower build. Now, can we use a thousand horsepower? Usually the, the consensus is no, uh, but I've always been a firm believer if you're not trying the, the latest and greatest in technology, uh, you're never gonna progress. And I've always been the type of guy that's always tried, tried stuff that hasn't been done before or tried stuff that was said that wouldn't work. Um, you know, there's so many great ECUs out there. There's so many great turbos out there now. So in recent years, there really hasn't been anybody that has tried to build a bike that's made this much horsepower. Uh, I know that somewhere overseas, I want to say it was, uh, man, I, I can't, I can't remember the shop overseas, but, uh, they, they built some real high horsepower stuff, some real, some real, uh, really nice stuff. Can't remember the name off the top of my head, but, uh, I think it was like last year or two years ago, they made a bike or they built a bike that dynoed in the high 900s. I'm going to say 980, 990, somewhere around there. So they were able to, to get that number down on the dyno. And then I think that engine ended up going into a bike that ended up running. Uh, again, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. I'm just kind of kind of running with this, but it went extremely fast in that half mile. I think it was like 220 or 230 or something like that. Uh, I'll, I'll, fi I'll find it when I'm editing this video and I'll, I'll put it up on the screen here. Um, how much horsepower did they use to, to get to that point? Uh, I, I don't know. But uh, like I said, this this bike here, uh, the target is going to be a thousand horsepower. And uh, it'll be able to do that just on boost alone. And then um, just to make sure, we'll also have a, a 300 shot direct port on the bike as well. So. This is kind of like the introduction video, showing you the bike, showing you all the parts that I have for it, and uh, just kind of letting you guys know where we're going with things. So as you can see, I got a table full of really awesome parts here, and I got a whole bunch of other ones over here. And we'll just go through it, and I'll show you guys what I have and uh, where we're going with this. So let me, uh, let's go outside real quick, and I'll show you guys the bike, and, uh, show you the, the virgin bike we get to uh, tear apart to build this monster. So let's head outside real quick. So this is what we're working with here, guys. This is the uh, sacrificial lamb, if you wanna, wanna call it that. So this is a brand new 2020 Ibusa. Uh, the owner bought it with the intentions of sending it to me to do a crazy build with it. Yeah, he did a couple things to it before it got here. Uh, he put the slip-on voodoo exhaust on there. Uh, would not recommend. They sound like doo-doo. And that, that's what a lot of people call those exhausts, I guess. Uh, but yeah, they, they sound terrible. It sounds like a Mack truck. Uh, he also uh, went ahead and put lowering links on it. Did the Brox uh, top clamp on it to, to lower the front end. You know, did the windscreen on it, took the decals off, and uh, the mirrors. Oh, and he did one of these really cool headlights. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to do it in the dark. It's hard to see, but the outsides here glow 
white, and then the, there are also the turn signals. It's a really cool headlight. I've never seen it before. But let's see, it's got uh, a nice virgin 412 miles on it. And it's, yeah, it's it's as stock as they come. So this thing's gonna be completely ripped apart. Uh, it's got a, a four over swing arm that we're putting on it. But also while it's apart, we're going to send everything out, have it powder coated. Got new foot pegs for it and all that good stuff. But uh, yeah, this is the last time you guys will see it looking like this. Now let's uh, go back inside and talk about the parts. Real quick guys, shameless plug here. If you guys haven't seen the other HP Tech uh, series videos, uh, this is Lucy. This is the, the bike that I did the 500 horsepower capable engine for $1,500. So if you guys haven't seen that build yet, uh, I'll have links down underneath and uh, you guys go ahead and check it out. But basically, I just wanted to take a stage one, two turbo kit, you know, stock engine, and see if I couldn't make 500 horsepower with it uh, for less than $1,500. And part of using that was using uh, some basically eBay rods, some no-name rods. But you can go and check out the other video, or the other video series, there should be three or four of them. I haven't put the last one up yet. But uh, yeah, it's just an 08. She looks a lot better in video. Uh, this thing's pretty, pretty ugly. Uh, this thing was very neglected before, before I had it, but whatever. And uh, I got a, I got the matching rear wheel there, but that's the tire I use for when it's on the dyno. But if you guys want to see if I hit that goal, you guys have to go through and look at the other video series. But uh, yeah, full exhaust with the turbo. AMS 2000, runs on E85. Let me go ahead and start it up real quick so you can hear it. in the engine room here to go over all the engine parts uh, got quite the uh, the spread of some real nice stuff here so what we're doing is well we'll first start off with the crank uh, this is a an APE 68 millimeter crank this is a, a billet crank this isn't a, a regrind as you'll notice it doesn't have the the center drive gear here for the balance shaft like like you see on, on these, you got a nice hammered ass crank right there. The IP eliminates that so it's less weight. And they balance it for a sustained uh, 14,000 RPM. So I haven't turned one that high before, but if, uh, if it's still making power, we'll still keep turning it. So Doing a stock bore setup, this is these are 81 millimeter uh, millimeter Wassner pistons, and with a 68 millimeter crank, uh, that brings the displacement up to a 1402. Now you can go APE makes a, a 72 millimeter crank, and with stock uh, displacement 81 millimeter pistons, that makes it a 1484. Uh, I decided to go with this crank just because once you get into 
real big strokes like that, uh, they tend not to like to rev as high. So played with the middle ground, get more displacement out of it. And, um, you know, but also too, when you get uh, these big, when you get big strokers, when the rod's coming around, uh, you get really extreme rod angles. So it really, the big strokers really like to wear out your rod bearings just because the rod angles get pretty extreme. So this is a good middle ground. This will make plenty of power. So like I said, we're using a 81 millimeter Wassner turbo pistons. These are nine and a half to one. Let's see. Yeah, these are nine to one uh, with a you know stock head and stock deck height, but the uh, the cylinder head that I have over there is shaved a little bit, so it's going to bump it up, bump the compression up a little bit to about ten to one. And of course, uh, these are just standard length uh, Gen two Wassner rods with the good rod bolts in them. So, you know, pretty standard off the shelf stuff. And uh, got a brand new Wassner standard bore uh, cylinder. Wassner started making these. They're really, really nice. Extremely nice. They come with the Nakasil coating on them. Uh, they're already sized and everything. So uh, they, I guess they started making these because the Gen 1 cylinders are starting to get harder to come by. So they cast their own uh, cylinders here. And so these are a Gen 1 style cylinder. Gen 1 and Gen 2 cylinders, I mean, you can interchange them. But the Gen 2s, they have uh, like reliefs right here. And I guess the intended purpose to that is for cylinder scavenging. So when, you know, this piston's going up and this one's going down, you have pressure on the back side of the pistons. So I guess Suzuki's idea was to chamfer this inside area so there's less restriction and you can get better uh, crankcase scavenging between the two is what I've been told what the reason is behind it. But with that being said, uh, Gen 2 cylinders like to crack right here. So even though we got a brand new engine, brand new cylinders, uh, going right to a brand new set of uh, Wassner cylinders. And uh, I was gonna, we were looking for, for billet cylinders, but billet cylinders with that still allow you to run water through them is uh, it's a hard thing to find. I found one. So moving on over here, we have Gen 2 head. This is already set up. This is what's called uh, uh, my Warhead package. And uh, it's a CNC ported cylinder head. Uh, Carpenter does the cylinder heads for me. And uh, basically it's just a, a head and cam combination that I came up with. And these are brand new billet cams. They're not regrinds or anything like that. And uh, these heads make a ton of power. If you take them on smaller turbos and, uh, you know, stock displacement, you know, they make a whole bunch more horsepower. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, I'll look through the videos while I'm doing this, but I, I got one post that's got, it's a stage two gen one that has one of my war heads on it. And like the horsepower you're getting per pound of boost uh, with this head and cam setup is, is pretty retarded. So it's a good way to squeeze out extra power if you're trying to get the most out of it. But uh, the set is CNC ported on the intake and exhaust. Uh, it's O-ringed. It's got new new seals, uh, stainless valves. I mean, it's got it's got everything in it. So it's a uh, it's a real badass head, and it's going to help us make a bit more power. Now to wrap things up here, of course we got the, uh, this is an inch and a half DME oil pan. Because this bike has, I have a set of forks for it that are, were cut by Macintosh, right before Macintosh went out. Uh, they're cut, 
uh, they basically have like an inch of travel left on them. And then they're also, uh, they also had like five pounds of weight added to them to help with wheelies. So we went with the inch and a half pan. And then uh, we can also slide the forks up another inch if we need to, because the, the bike's gonna be super, super low. The last thing you wanna do is come down and smack the oil pan on the ground and uh, put oil down the track. So as much as it's, it's a cool billet part, it's also uh, it's a safety thing too. As far as the clutch goes, uh, we have the APE billet outer basket and billet inner basket. So nothing, nothing too crazy here. We are using the NLR boost compensated clutch. And that's a really, really great clutch. Uh, it's, I mean, it's great for drag racing, but for the average street guy, they're, they're really good because you can run stock springs in them. Uh, and the, the clutch is compensated. It adds pressure to the pressure plate uh, using boost from the turbo and uh, it'll hold any power you throw at it. So the benefit to it is, to it is you know, if you're uh, like just to do roll races or you just do a whole bunch of street riding, uh, it allows you to keep the, the factory soft clutch lever, but when you're in boost, it'll hold anything you throw at it. So we're just gonna hook the clutch straight up to the plenum uh, on the turbo kit and just let it stack boost on top of it. And uh, I've never had any problems with those clutches slipping to go with the max ECU race ECU uh, for guys that aren't familiar with the max ECUs uh, I believe they're out of Australia but dollar per dollar when you compare it against other like Motex or like even the Hollies really uh, I don't know about the Hollies but any of the big major uh, ECU companies these ECUs here are the most packed, they come completely unlocked and they do everything from, they'll do uh, <clears throat> variable valve timing on engines that have that, uh, of course, boost control, they have a built-in map sensor, they do traction control, uh, shift kill for air shifters for sequential transmissions. So if you have a car with a sequential transmission, uh, it'll do the ignition kill, but bikes have a se sequential transmission in them. So that'll work for it. And, uh, it's just all around just a badass ECU. And uh, my, my main reason for going with this is, so the, the brand new boosts have uh, ABS sensors on them, which I'll be getting rid of the ABS sensors. And instead I'll be using that, the ABS sensors for uh, traction control. Um, again, this is one of those things, like I said earlier, you know, I'm always trying to work with the latest and greatest, you know, technology that's out there. You know, for the longest time, people said you couldn't make, uh, you know, you couldn't put down 500 horsepower on the street or you couldn't use X amount of horsepower. Well, electronics have gotten better. And with the addition of traction control, uh, who knows, maybe we might be able to put down all thousand horsepower. We'll see. Uh, another thing that I have here is so this is an infrared ride height sensor. So this will hook to the ECU and this will be mounted down by like the oil pan <clears throat> or maybe on the bottom of the forks. I don't know yet, have, have to see when I get there. But basically if the bike goes up in a, in a wheelie and this is really, really fast reacting, this will tell the ECU that the front end's coming up and depending on where I configure it, It'll pull timing, it'll cut ignition. I mean, you can program the ECU to do anything. So basically if it comes up and rips a big nasty wheelie, I mean, this is, you know, a reassurance to help keep the front end down if uh, for some reason you can't catch it with the throttle. But also too, if you can get the front end to where it's just floating, uh, that's, <laughs> that's usually the, the best place uh, when you're putting down power is, you know, if you're not spinning, but the front end is just real light, uh, that's when you know you're on the brink of, uh, you know, putting down as much power. So these are Rife sensors. Now these are really cool. So when you do a standalone ECU, you have the option to add in a whole bunch of sensors that 
you don't, wouldn't normally get. So this here is actually a really good value. Is it, uh, it's really hard to configure the factory uh, Suzuki uh, coolant temp sensors. So it's usually just easier just to get an aftermarket sensor. Well, what's cool with this is I'll have to make a bung to, to put it into the head, <clears throat> but this is a coolant temp sensor or sorry, coolant. Yeah, it's a coolant temp sensor, but also it's a coolant pressure sensor all built into one. You see, it's got five wires there. So one sensor does two things. It makes the setup simpler. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, if you can monitor your coolant pressure, you might be able to detect if, uh, you know, you're starting to get into a head gasket issue or something like that. So these are really cool. They're really not that expensive uh, compared to uh, if you went and got like a Holly sensor or something like that. Uh, but the money that you pay versus what you get, you know, two sensors in one, you save money and it makes for a simpler setup. The next thing I want to show you guys that we have here is this uh, Rife sensor block. So what this is, is it's four individual uh, pressure transducers. And this allows you to remote mount the sensors somewhere else on the bike. Or if you're using it on a car, you can remote mount it onto the firewall. Because the biggest killer of all these sensors is uh, engine vibration. So if you can remote remote mount the sensors, your sensors, uh, they read a lot better because you're not getting the vibrations. A lot of sensors will pick up on that, but also too, it extends the life of the sensor because it's not getting as hot and it's uh, not vibrating so much. So let's talk about cost of this thing. These are available on motionraceworks.com. Uh, it's a really great company. You guys probably know of them if you guys dabble in the automotive world, especially in the LS or the the Coyote stuff. Uh, they make a lot of awesome products, but this is something that they sell. And uh, when you total it up, like each 100 PSI Holly sensor, which is basically, you know, it's just an SSI sensor. Uh, I want to say they're like, they're over $100 a piece. Whereas this with the billet case, billet casing and everything, I want to say it was like 300. So you, you get a lot more for your money and these are all completely replaceable. Uh, these are all hundred PSI. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to use them all for, but I know for sure I'm going to have to change one of these out and do like a 2000 PSI sensor. Cause I said the, the bike's going to have nitrous on it as well. So I want to be able to monitor the, the bottle pressure. And the other cool thing is, is it's just one plug and you can uh, wire, wire this into the ECU and use just one plug. So it's another thing to help simplify the setup. This is a really, really trick piece. And uh, if you're looking into building a standalone or you need sensors to do a data logger, this is definitely the way to go. So the last part of the electronics that we have here is we have some uh, ID seven, uh, or 1700 injectors. So these are meant to replace just the top set on the, uh, the fuel rail. I don't know with, I'm, I'm gonna run stock sensor or stock uh, injectors on the bottom rail and throw these in there and see how far we can get I might need to upgrade the the bottom set of injectors uh, to get to get to our goal, but uh, they they make a, another set for the bottom injectors as well. Uh, we are running uh, E98 fuel or E90 fuel. Uh, I forgot which one the uh, the owner says he has most access to, but we're gonna be running ethanol fuel, and because of that. This is our fuel pump. So most electric fuel pumps, and there's some great ones out on the market now, and even the brush, brushless ones are really nice. But the problem is, uh, if you've been messing with Hibusas for a long period of time, you'll know the charging systems aren't the best. And when you start getting into getting into a fuel pump that can flow enough fuel, you know, for 
say, you know, 1200 horsepower on, on ethanol fuel, uh, it's going to be very taxing. And this is fully meant to be a street bike. You know, the guy just wants to roll race with it and do like FL2K and all that stuff. So the solution to that is this is a eight gallon per hour or sorry, eight gallon per minute mechanically driven fuel, uh, fuel pump. So what this does is this goes uh, on the engine, right? And you take the uh, water pump out and this goes in its place and then it's driven directly off the crank. And because that's taking the place of the water pump, uh, I'm switching over to a billet electric water pump and that'll all be controlled by the, by the ECU as well. So I'm gonna gut the thermostat, put electric water pump on it and let the ECU uh, control all the flow for it. And I, I don't think we'll have any problems keeping that thing cool. So that brings us to the turbo. This here is a, a Garrett GT3582, and this is the, the Gen 2 series. So this has got their improved 11-blade uh, wheel. Uh, I think it's got better bearings, different backside turbine wheel. I can't remember all the differences. They're badass. This thing is rated for 900 horsepower, but when you're dealing with bikes, because they can rev so high, you can get more than that. So this should easily push us to you know, around 40 pounds of boost, somewhere is around you know, 1,000 horsepower. And if not, like I said, we'll have nitrous on it to push it that far. Now, we can also use nitrous for charge cooling to help aid it if we need it. That's another reason why we put it on there. And we can also help for spool. Like I said, this will do. Uh, this bike is going to be a street bike, going to be a roll race bike, so we can use it for uh, for roll racing to help spool. Uh, the ECU itself does have rolling anti lag and all that stuff on it, so we should have no problem getting this thing to spool. And these things, thirty five Rs, they generally they're they're laggier than your typical stage two turbos by a little bit, but not by much, especially when you get into the Gen two stuff. These turbos are awesome. They make a lot of power, and especially for their size. In order to make the four, the, the GTX series, oh yeah, this is the GTX GT3582 Gen 2. That's a mouthful. But uh, before, if you want to get to these kinds of uh, horsepower numbers, you needed to go with like a GT4086, and it's a significant, significantly larger turbo. So smaller turbo, easier packaging, uh, lighter. So you just can't really go wrong with these. But super nice stuff. Have you had enough of really cool parts yet? Yeah, I didn't think so either. So show you, this is kind of the rest of the stuff we have here. So of course you can see these are have a set of BST wheels for it. These are the six and a quarter inch wide, I think. They're not the six, but uh, yeah, BST is front and back. Has the uh, worldwide ceramic bearings in there. It also has, uh, because we're using the, the ABS sensors for, for the traction control, so we have the, the reluctor wheels that go on here. And uh, Outside here, I have a box big enough I, I can I can fit in, and it's all carbon fiber parts. It's all stuff from Montgomery. The only thing that's not going to be carbon fiber on this is the frame, swing arm, and uh, parts of the bodywork. So if you guys haven't seen this Montgomery stuff in person, uh, it's super nice. This is real deal carbon fiber. Super light, super strong. Just super nice stuff. So this is a front fairing stay. And also, you know, we got the uh, the inner fairings. I, there's the full set. Goes up and around the dash and all that. He has all that. And this is probably the coolest thing, I think. I've never seen one of these before either. This is a full carbon fiber uh, subframe. 
Uh, you can see here it's, I mean, you can pick up a sock subframe one-handed, but not this easily. Super nice stuff. I just like looking at it. So yeah, the bike will be all carbon fiber. I mean, anything carbon fiber you can make for it, it's pretty much on the bike. And yes, the bikes come factory with the factory Brembo's and uh, decided to go with the aftermarket. These are the, the monoblock, the, the M4 brake calipers. So these are the, the real deal, really expensive uh, brake calipers. Uh, if you haven't ridden a bike, uh, I think some people might say that What's the difference between these and the ones that are on the bike? Uh, the big difference with the brake calipers are, uh, I think the pistons are bigger in these, but also too, they're more rigid than what the, the factory Suzuki Brembo's are. <clears throat> and that might not sound like a big deal, but if you've ever ridden a bike that actually has these calipers on it, uh, the, the difference in braking and uh, brake lever feel is huge. And of course, up on the shelf, I do have the, the matching uh, clutch and uh, brake master cylinders, all Brembo as well. So that's pretty much the full setup. That's pretty much everything I have here. Um, got a lot of work ahead of me, and uh, you know it's going to take a little while to do. But uh, if you guys are interested in following along and seeing what I do and see the progress of this bike, <clears throat> be sure to subscribe to the channel. And uh, I'll put the links to like those Rife sensors and stuff like that if you guys are interested in where I got them from. But uh, yeah, so that's going to round up our intro to uh, this 1,000 horsepower build. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. Take it easy.